Welcome to this week's Mountain West ADC Echo. My name is Brian Wood, Medical Director, and I will turn it over to today's speaker. Hi, everybody. I'm going to give a rapid fire update, just more to let you know what has been changed, and then you can delve a little bit deeper if you need. Most of the changes in the perinatal guidelines, which were just released um, last Friday, December 7th, which is an update from the November 2017 guidelines, are pretty minor. And they are available here. So I just wanted to put in a slide to remind us why we care about this so much. And this is the estimated incidence of perinatal HIV infection for 100,000 live births in the US since 1978 to 2013. And you can see, you know, there was quite a peak at the beginning of the epidemic. And then they put in the milestones of a lot of important things that happened that helped decrease perinatal transmission. But thankfully, it has just continued to be a trend downwards. And at this point, of we think about 5,000 women with HIV who give birth in the United States every year. In 2013, only 69 were born with HIV and the incidence was 1.8 out of 100,000 births. The CDC has a goal of less than one out of 100,000 live births. And I will just say that Brian and I sit here and we give advice, but we are not the people who are taking care of these women with HIV who are pregnant, you are. And I really want to credit all of you for helping with these numbers. And so many of you are taking care of these pregnant women. So I applaud you. I'm gonna go through just the changes, and again, not the prettiest transitions, but we will just fly through. So there was a new section about women who desired breastfeed in the US, and that was actually added in March, 27, uh, March 27th of 2018, but that was really only added to, formally to the guidelines now. Breastfeeding is still not recommended in the US. Um, when women with HIV do choose to breastfeed, despite counseling, they should be counseled, and they have a really nice list of how to counsel these women to minimize the risk of transmission. They recommend saying to all pregnant women, in the United States, we recommend formula feeding to avoid the risk of HIV transmission to your baby through breast milk. Do you have any questions or concerns about that? And we point out that that's just a really nice non-judgmental way to open this conversation. And we had a great echo talk from Judy Levison from Baylor um, on November 2nd, 2017, and I put a link to that. They also have made some changes in the um, HIV testing section. And one thing they really stress for the first time is making sure that partners of women with or without HIV, partners of any pregnant women, should be encouraged to be HIV tested. And that really hasn't been an emphasis before. And that's to make sure that even if your patient doesn't have HIV, that they're not at ongoing risk during their pregnancy of HIV, if their partner has HIV, getting them linked to care. They also risk, recommend a risk assessment of all women considering pregnancy and all pregnant women, even if they were previously tested negative. And I think that is because some people think, well, they were pregnant a year ago and they were HIV negative. We don't need to retest. But it is really important to retest and counsel every pregnancy because things change. And if women are high risk, really talk about prevention counseling and considering PrEP. They also stress retesting certain individuals in the third trimester, and they stress before 36 weeks if possible. And they added this time women who are incarcerated or who reside in states that require third trimester testing. I searched long and hard to find which states those were. In the 2006 CDC testing recommendations, they have a list. I don't know if it's been updated since then, but that is what they actually reference in these current perinatal guidelines. Most of the states were in the um, Northeast and Southeast and Texas, none included really the states that most of us live in. In women at high risk, even if they're not in a state that mandates it, we should think about their trimester testing and certainly any woman with signs or symptoms of acute HIV. In terms of changes in preconception counseling, they stress again, it's very important to discuss reproductive desires with all women of childbearing age on an ongoing basis throughout their course of care. And really emphasize the primary treatment goal in pregnancy is a sustained viral load suppression for the health of the woman, baby, and her partner. And then, of course, new counseling about dalutegravir. And you may all feel like we have hashed this out, and I sort of do too. So we're going to go th quickly through what they finally harmonize the recommendations with the perinatal guidelines and the ARV guidelines. And that is actually a kind of a theme in these updates. For the first time, they really try to make it so their guidelines 
are harmonized or synchronized with the antiretroviral guidelines, which is wonderful. By their own admission, they changed the guidelines about um, dalutegravir and that they are very conservative, and that was their word, and they said they will likely or may change in 2019 when we have additional data from this study that was discontinued. So to summarize it as quickly as possible, women who um, are starting dalutegravir should have a pregnancy test. Women who are pregnant and less than 14 weeks since their last menstrual period or 12 weeks since conception or trying to conceive or unable to consistently use contraception should ideally not be on dalutegravir. But after 14 weeks, dalutegravir is considered a preferred NC during pregnancy. And if dalutegravir is used at the time of delivery or after delivery, again, discuss contraception in these women. How about women who come to you who are already on dalutegravir but are in their first trimester? So to continue or not to continue? The counseling messages they give us, which I have to say are not real convincing for changing, is that neural tube defects may have already occurred. Depending on the current gestational age, the additional risk of these defects developing during the remaining time in the first trimester is probably small. Everyone has a background risk of neural tube defects, regardless of whether they have HIV or are on medications. And that changes in therapy, even in the first trimester, are often associated with viral rebound that may increase the risk of perinatal HIV transmission. I think if you had that conversation with your patient, <laughs> they wouldn't be very likely to change, but it's um, important to have the conversation so they're aware of risks and benefits. They also added some new information and the reproductive options for serodiscordant couples, which I found really exciting and heartening because even in the last guidelines, they were still quite tepid about U equals U messaging, but there really was more emphasis on U equals U messaging, undetectable equals untransmissible if the viral load is suppressed. And basically said, if, if the um, HIV, part, the partner living with HIV has a suppressed viral load that they can be engaging in condomless sexual intercourse, ideally around the time of trying to conceive. They also really stress PrEP if the viral load is not suppressed in the infected partner. There was significantly less emphasis on assisted reproductive technologies, which previously were made to sound like the most ideal options, and they've really de-emphasized them. They mention them as options, but they don't emphasize them. They also added some clarity about infertility workups for couples attempting to conceive via condomless sexual intercourse. And they say if conception doesn't occur within six months, these patients should have infertility workup, including semen analysis. And then finally, if the male partner does not have HIV, they say it's important to use condoms when not trying to conceive. Educate the male partner about the importance of the partner's adherence to meds, which is kind of interesting, I think trying to add additional support. I can see situations if there's intimate partner violence where putting the partner in control of nagging or encouraging adherence could be a difficult situation. But I think it is important that everyone is aware of the importance of the pregnant person with HIV taking their ART. And then they recommended HIV testing every three months while attempting conception without condoms. In terms of general principles regarding use of antiretroviral drugs during pregnancy, I'm a little surprised that this is something new, and I wonder if it's just the wording change, but they said it was new to screen for depression and anxiety as part of their assessment for supportive care. Provide counseling about what to expect during LND and the postnatal period, and I feel like we and the ECHO family have really mastered this. We've really realized how important it is to talk to women before they go into the delivery room as to what to expect what to do about infant feeding, and how to handle those situations if they're not going to breastfeed. They also talked about coordinating services with a multidisciplinary team, which we are doing, I think, a great job at. In terms of antiretroviral therapy in pregnancy, they have um, different categories, and they've actually added one, preferred alternative, insufficient data to recommend. Usually that's for initiation in pregnancy. And then they added not recommended except in special circumstances. 
and that includes situations in which treatment experienced pregnant women may need to initiate or continue drugs with limited safety and efficacy data or specific safety concerns. And then there's a not recommended section. And then they added a new table for situation-specific recommendations for ART in pregnant women and those trying to conceive. And that is an amazing table. I can highly recommend it. They basically go through every single drug and have a recommendation for every situation, whether they're initiating ART, whether they've been on ART before, whether they're failing their current regimen, all kinds of things. So it's, it's quite a table. And I borrowed this from Brian when he gave his talk this summer about what he thought was the optimal regimen prior to this guideline update. And the big changes here are that these are the preferred regimens for treatment naive, naive pregnant women. The NRTI backbones that they recommend are tenofovir with FTC or 3TC, or a back of your 3TC, again, with the same restrictions that we always talk about with the back of ear. In terms of INSTEs, raltegravir or dalutegravir after the first trimester are considered preferred. And then PIs, adazanavir and ritonavir or boosted darunavir with ritonavir, but that must be used BID. I've highlighted the changes in red here. I think I might have forgotten to highlight bictegravir. Alternative regimens are combivir or AZT3TC of favarins or rilpivirine with, again, the usual restrictions. And then um, in terms of PIs, you can use lapinavir, ritonavir. Brian and I were noting before this that now the only single tablet regimen that's even considered alternative are favarins in the form of atripla or rilpivirine in the form of complera. So that's a little bit disheartening. And now favarins has been given really full reign to be used. There's insufficient data in basically all of our newer medicines and not recommended. Um, you can see that column. And the key um, change here is cobacistet. So cobacistet, cobacistet boosted regimens in pregnancy, there is significant concern based on data about decreased plasma levels in the second and third trimesters. And so if someone is on a cobe containing regimen, they say consider switching to another regimen that is recommended for use in pregnancy. And if you must continue a cobe containing regimen, absorption should be optimized and viral load should be monitored frequently. So what if, after all your best efforts, a patient has a detectable viral load or virologic failure? Well, this section was updated to include that you should really talk about food requirements and possible drug interactions. And again, this is something we talk about here all the time. Consider INSTE resistance testing if someone's previously been on an INSTE, they have a sex partner with INSTE history, or they're starting or changing to an INSTE late in pregnancy. And then viral load testing is currently recommended at 34 to 36 weeks gestation for delivery planning. Providers may consider repeat testing even after that in select women who are at high risk for viral rebound. The CD4 cell count monitoring recommendations were just changed to say in most women, if they have consistently greater than 300 um, CD4 cells and they've been on ART for greater than two years, that they do not need to have a CD4 count checked after the initial test at their first antenatal visit. And so again, harmonizing really with the um, ARB guidelines. They talk about women who have HIV and Hep C in pregnancy, and there's been data to show that there's really low uptake of Hep C testing in Hep C exposed infants. In general, we think there's about a 6% transmission risk of Hep C from a, a mother to baby. In women with HIV, that's probably double, then we think about 10 to 20% risk. And so they really want to stress that these babies should be tested for hep C. And they give specific recommendations, hep C antibody test after 18 months. Hep C RNA testing is not recommended in the neonatal period um, and definitely not before two months. And they basically say also if you have a negative hep C RNA early on, it means nothing because viremia can be intermittent. In terms of acute HIV in pregnancy, it depends on when the diagnosis is made. In the first trimester, they recommend a boosted PI be used because, again, concerns about dalutegravir. And they think raltegravir has too low of a barrier to um, resistance. In the second trimester, they want us to use dalutegravir. And they also point out if you diagnose someone with acute HIV in the postpartum period, make sure they stop breastfeeding. Those infants of women who 
develop acute HIV during their pregnancy should be treated like a high-risk infant for HIV exposure because of the potential for high vir viremia. They also point out that women um, may be extremely susceptible to HIV infection during pregnancy and breastfeeding, and so women who are at high risk really need counseling and discussion of PrEP. Delayed cord clamping was addressed um, in this most recent guidelines, and there was a recent study of 64 HIV positive mother and infant pairs where the mother was living with HIV, um, and they compared, these are split down the middle, delayed clamping, which was 120 seconds after birth, or early clamping, cord clamping, 30 seconds after birth, and the mean hemoglobin levels at 24 hours and one month after birth were significantly higher with delayed cord clamping, and there were no HIV transmissions, increased risk of jaundice, or polycythemia in 18 months with delayed cord clamping. Again, that's only 32 infants that had delayed cord clamping. They don't make a recommendation. They just put that data out there, but they do say in women without HIV, ACOG recommends delayed clamping in vigorous term and preterm infants. So I think we don't have totally specific recommendations, but we have some nice early data to suggest that delayed cord clamping may be safe in this population. I'm going to just speed through these last few slides. Postpartum follow-up of women with HIV. ACOG has changed their recommendations to say that all women should have contact with their obstetric care provider within the first three weeks of the postpartum period, and that is earlier than, than I think is, has always been done. Women with HIV are recommended to have a follow appointment with the health care provider who manages their HIV care, whether that's their obstetric provider or their HIV care provider, within two to four weeks after hospital discharge. And I think this is to really stress retention and care and then make sure that they're on the right ART. They also really stress it's okay to change ART after delivery because in certain point, certain women, you're going to be able to simplify their regimen because we just talked about there's not a lot of single tablet regimens. ART management of newborns with perinatal HIV exposure or perinatal HIV. They just changed some of the recommendations, and I'm not going to go through at length, but there are very minor changes. They did stress that in all cases where a newborn is considered higher risk of HIV acquisition, AZT should be continued for six weeks. There's some debate about whether other medications need to be continued. And then they also pointed out that for Women who have non-B subtype HIV or group O HIV, that there are now tests available, and those should be used in those babies of those women. And finally, we've been talking about updating our ECHO birth plan. I was telling Brian, I don't love the expression birth plan because it gives the idea that you can plan anything about birth. But um, we're going to update this now that the perinatal guidelines have come out so that everyone can have access to that. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West HIV Project Echo Didactic Series. If you're interested in other talks, we invite you to subscribe to this YouTube channel. You can select the red subscribe button. You can also find additional talks by searching YouTube for MWATC Project Echo. Until next week's edition, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.